It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman. I am here with Cindy Black, our executive director here at Redeemer Radio for our regular Theology of the Body Thursday segment. Thanks for being here, Cindy. Good morning. Good morning. This week, we didn't celebrate, but we remember the anniversary of Roe versus Wade legalizing abortion in the United States. And I know we talked a little bit about last week about how theology of the body can teach us in really quite obvious ways, but also some maybe not so obvious ways about abortion and being pro-life. And I know this week you wanted to share a little bit of your personal story. Yeah. So last week, just as we were beginning our conversation, I got this little nudge that I was supposed to share my story, but I hadn't you know, talk to you about it. Um, mm-hmm. And also, I wanted to get permissions from some family members because it's not, I'll try to tell it in a way that is fair that's just about my story. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to say that I share this without judgment on anyone's role in my story mm-hmm. and without judgment anyone for anyone out there that has traveled this journey. Sure. Um, we're all unique and all have our own stories, and God works differently with everyone. It didn't take long. I wasn't very old when I figured out that my age, when I started doing math, Mm -hmm. um, that my mom was very young when she had me. And when I was growing up, my parents divorced when I was seven years old. And so my mother's father took an active role in being a masculine influence in my life, fathered me in many ways. I mean, Mm -hmm would always always knew when report cards were coming out and you know would call and things like that. So he was very engaged in my life. When I figured out how young my mom was, I did know that she had planned to go down to IU and be the first female in um in her family to attend college. Uh-huh. And Later, I would learn that she was actually supposed to live in Briscoe, which is where I lived my freshman year of college, huh. uh, which I didn't know until I got assigned to Briscoe. So um, then I started getting more engaged in the pro-life movement as I began getting involved in youth ministry and things like that. And I realized that you know Roe versus Wade was just five years after I was born, mm-hmm. and it kind of made me wonder about what if abortion was legal during that time. Yeah, and then I learned that my grandfather, that I was very close to, and he he died of cancer when I was a freshman in high school. So this was just probably. Around when I was working for the diocese, around 2006, 2007, is when I learned that my grandfather had pressured one of my aunts, who is not very much older than me, to have an abortion when she was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So I started wondering okay, my mom was 17. If Roe versus Wade, if abortion was legal, I have no reason to think that he wouldn't have pressured her to do the same thing. Right. So I shared that with my mom. I just said, you know, I think about Roe versus Wade and had abortion been legal, would you have been pressured? And she said, well, just because it wasn't legal does not mean that it didn't exist. And she shared with me that her father knew of somebody that could take care of her situation and that she was pressured. And in fact, she was told that she couldn't live under their roof unless she made that decision. So she ended up moving in with my paternal grandparents. So she went to live with my father and uh, my grandparents and their family. So my dad was the oldest of seven and I had an aunt that was two years older than me and an uncle that's four years older than me. Mm -hmm. So they moved in with my grandparents so that they could choose life for me. Yeah. Uh, just something that I I really never knew. And, you know, I stopped to think 
like I, I especially as a mom look at the goodness in my children, like their infinite goodness, like the fact that they exist adds to the glory of God's creation. Right. And then I start thinking, if I didn't exist, they wouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. Or if I, I mean, of course I would exist. I would just hopefully Not be in heaven. But earth, if I, yeah. yeah. But if I hadn't been given a chance to be born that then my children wouldn't have been given a chance to be born. And uh, so I, th- I think it does bring another perspective to the whole, it, it makes it very real for me. Yeah. And I think a lot of people do have personal experience and this is a, a real thing, but I think for a lot of people, it's a hypothetical. It's uh, something that we don't really associate with real people struggling with this or it, it, we don't know somebody that's personally been affected by it or we don't realize it. Right. You yeah. know? And so we can talk a lot about fetus and dehumanize it, but whenever you start hearing people's stories, I think it gives it a totally different dimension. How old were you when you made this connection? Oh, um, well, it was gradual, but the whole, when I asked my mom and heard the story, that was just maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. And so how has that affected you as far as uh, pro-life issues go or like on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade? Do you think about it differently or? I do. Um, not in the way that I thought I was going to, because I thought like, oh, I was spared because of being before Roe versus Wade, Uh. but um, it does help me to know that we definitely have to change hearts and help people to realize that that isn't a solution. I mean, we have a long way to go, but in some states, there might be some challenges to Roe versus Wade. You know, we know the tragedy in New York right now, but we also have to change hearts because uh, it, it won't make abortion go away, especially automatically. So we have to help people to understand what it is and what it does, not only to the baby, but to to the rest of us, to the right. mother and and everyone else. And you know, um, I think back like that was I was born in 1968. Technology has come a long way. So when I have when I put myself in my grandfather's shoes, he didn't know. I mean, he right now people are still buying the lies and the propaganda of oh, the sure. abortion, yeah. like language and things like that. Back then. Pregnant women weren't having sonograms or ultrasounds. So, you know, it was a lot easier to believe that you were just having a procedure to take care of a clump of cells. So I think educating people is a big factor. Yeah, I think even today, there are people that want abortion, I believe, for evil purposes. Like they, there's an evil force Mm -hmm. and that they are consumed by that in one way or another and are promoting abortion for very bad reasons. But also I think a lot of people are in favor of abortion out of ignorance of what it actually is, even today. And a false sense of compassion. Yeah. Like we've got to give women this choice. um, Right. And we know that it's not just like other choices. Right. So as much as we work and fight and financially and dedicate our time to support women's pregnancy centers to offer an alternative and to support women that are in crisis pregnancy, I think one thing that we have to recognize is there is pressure, Mm -hmm. sometimes by family members, sometimes by boyfriend or husband, Mm -hmm. or sometimes just the external pressures of, I am supposed to go to college and this is going to mess up that plan. Or I am supposed to, uh, now I got my college degree, I'm supposed to be doing this work and this is going to mess up my plan. And these pressures, whether it be external or internal, to make a certain choice and to realize we need to empower women to be able to say, look, I'm not going to give in to that pressure. Your mom was a Mm -hmm. a great example of that. She was pressured, but said, you know, who knows why she decided not to give in to that, but to say that I, uh, I, I'm willing to sacrifice some of my plans for this other person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because of my situation with the divorce and various other factors, I really 
didn't grow up with a close relationship with my dad, but I was able to call him and just thank him for mm. choosing life, like standing by my mom and and not choosing that option. And um, then also, not long after I put that together, we were leading servant leadership retreats in South Bend, um, BCX, and I was able to serve at Hannah's house. Mm. And that just brought it all home that the women there are in similar situations as my mom faced with me being told you either need to have this abortion or you're not welcome here. Right. So, you know, that, that is a real thing that still, still happens today, like you mentioned. And now in the Fort Wayne area, we have a mother's hope. So I think that's something that when we think about women who make abortion decisions, we don't know all the influences, like you said, the pressures and things like that, that if women are, are given that ultimatum, you know, how difficult that must be. Right. Well, and there's so many different stories. Yours is just one of them, but you know, I've heard stories from men and women who have survived abortions and just hearing the oftentimes compassion that they have for whatever situation that their mother was in, but also realizing that their life has value and that had things gone differently, they wouldn't be here. Yeah. And, and it's just amazing to think about. Yeah. And I think also thinking about, you know, statistically one in four women have, have experienced abortion directly. Wow. That, you know, I've heard people say, well, I don't really know anyone who's ever had an abortion. Well, right. there's a good chance that you do um, yeah. statistically. And I think we have to keep that in our mind when we interact, especially get in pro-life debates, um, especially with social media. And it, even not even on social media, even in person with people that we know, because we don't know what kind of pain we might be uncovering, That mm-hmm. that it could be that they can't allow themselves to see the truth because of the pain that that will bring forth. Right. So I think making that part of our conversation to say, you know, even women who have made abortion decisions are not condemned. There is mercy and forgiveness. And that there's a lot of factor, acknowledging those factors that can influence those decisions, letting people know that we want to journey with those women and men also. Well, what they need is healing, right. not condemnation. Exactly. They don't need to feel worse about their decision. Right. They need to know that there's grace and there's there's forgiveness and they can put at least some of it behind them. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. you have to live with your decisions right. for the rest mm-hmm. of your life, but that there can be healing, especially, you know, when you didn't know any better or the pressure just seemed overwhelming or whatever that there's different circumstances that can reduce the culpability. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Cindy, for sharing your story. I appreciate that. Yeah. And we'll have future topics of Theology of the Body Thursday. Let us know if you have any suggestions or questions. Our thanks to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting this show and for their support. And all those that support Redeemer Radio, we appreciate you. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Until then, remember to leave room for the Holy Spirit.